Welcome to the Computer Tutor. On this tape, you'll soon learn how to avoid the 29 biggest computer mistakes. Now here's the Computer Tutor herself, Kim Commando. Who hasn't heard learn from your mistakes? Well, you don't have to make the same mistakes other people do with their computers in order to learn from them. The good news is during this tape, you're going to learn the most common mistakes people make using a computer, but more importantly, how to avoid them in the first place. And it's easy to make mistakes using a computer. You're not alone if you do. What's great about this tape is after watching it, you have no reason to make common computer mistakes. I'm going to tell you some of the best kept secrets that can save you time, effort, and in some cases money too, as you make a computer part of your life. Buy some clothes and there's a tag with a size on the inside. The size tells you whether it fits or not. Like this shirt is small, I know that it will fit me. Now on computer software boxes, there's an area that usually says requirements. That's like sizes on clothing. It tells you whether the software will work on your computer, and here's how you read the software's requirements. Starting at the top, you need an IBM PC or compatible type of computer that's a 286, 386, or 486 computer with Microsoft Windows, too. Your computer should have at least one megabytes of RAM. Running DOS 3.1 or above means DOS 4, 5, or 6. Your computer should also have a hard disk, and the number in parentheses tells you how much space the software program takes on the computer. And your computer should also have one floppy disk drive that could be a 5 and a quarter inch or a 3 and a half inch disk drive. A Microsoft mouse or one that looks and works like a Microsoft mouse is optional, and you see this in parentheses. Well, this means you don't need a mouse, but it's a good idea to use one because the program will be easier to use with one. Now, here's the name of the company that publishes the software. This software is for an Apple Macintosh computer. It says Mac right on the box. To make sure you buy the right software for your computer, go software shopping with the purchase receipt from your computer in one hand and then match it up with the software requirements on the box. It's that simple. A lot of people make the mistake of buying a computer by first picking up the newspaper and doing some price shopping. What you really want to do first is your homework. And the best way to shop for a computer is to start by making a list describing what you plan to use the computer for. I made this list, but you could make your own even if it's scribbling on a piece of paper. For example, almost everyone wants to write letters on their computer, so put this on the list. Maybe you want to publish your own newsletter, keep an appointment book, have thousands of recipes at your fingertips, draw plans for a dream house, or even trace those family roots. For a small business, a computer could help with the accounting and track customer orders with names and addresses. Some computers have a modem that lets you send and receive faxes, too, just like a regular fax machine. A computer can help with almost any type of job these days, so don't limit yourself on what you put on that list. After you're done putting down everything that you want to use a computer for, put down some times like today, six months, and a year from now. Then take this list to three or four computer stores. If you're not sure where any stores are around you, look at the ads in your local newspaper. Ask the salesperson at each computer store to recommend a computer based on this list. Ask them about the software, a printer, and get a written price quote that you can take home. Remember, service after the sale is important. Be sure to ask how long the warranty is on the computer and make sure the computer has at least a one-year warranty. Not everyone needs to have the most expensive and powerful computer. If you're out computer shopping, a 386 or 486 computer with a VGA monitor 4 megabytes of RAM, Windows, and an 80 or 100 megabyte hard disk is great for most people. You can always add the extras later. Say maybe a CD-ROM drive that will let you put an encyclopedia, have music and video on your personal computer. But there's more things you can add. Maybe you want a modem that turns your computer into something that's like a fax machine so you can send and receive faxes with that personal computer. 
or how about some gear that will let you compose and also play music with your personal computer. After you feel comfortable using that computer, there's so much you can do. As far as a printer, there's a lot of them out there, and the difference comes down to what you want to print out, how good the quality of the printout is, and how much money you want to spend. Dot matrix printers, they're the bottom of the line. Inkjet printers are good, and laser printers are perfect for desktop publishing. Whatever you buy, always remember to shop around and check how long the warranty is. Also, keep a record of all your computer parts along with any serial numbers, just in case it's stolen. If you have homeowner's insurance, call your insurance agent and tell them you bought a computer too so that it can be included on the policy. Don't buy software just for the sake of it. Like music for your stereo, buy what you think you'll use time and time again. You can spend $10 or $500 for a word processing program, for example. The price difference is directly related to the features in the software. Generally speaking, the more expensive the software, the more it does. Now, if you're not sure which software program is for you, just about any software store will help you decide. Ask a computer salesperson at the store to demonstrate the software for you, or at least tell you more about it. Computer salespeople normally spend their free time trying out new software and reading all sorts of computer magazines just so they can answer questions from customers like you. Learn two or three software programs, get the gist of those, and then go buy some more. This way you won't feel overwhelmed or feel compelled to learn everything at once. Buying a used computer hoping to save some money by putting in new parts causes more headaches a lot of times than it's really worth. Computers, they're picky machines, and if everything isn't in its place just right, the machine could have some problems. It's almost like restoring a vintage Mustang and finding parts could be a hassle, not to mention putting them in just right. Plus, the cost of rebuilding a computer it easily ends up to be just about the same as if you bought a new computer in the first place. It's not a bad idea to buy a used computer. It becomes a bad idea if the intention is to make a used computer a brand new computer by taking out the old parts and putting in new parts. The styrofoam in boxes, computers come in when you buy them. They should be stored in a dry place. These boxes are sturdy and perfect for when you have to move or ship the computer somewhere. And they're hard to find again if you throw them away. And plus, if you have to buy the boxes, it's going to cost you some money. So save the boxes and save the styrofoam. It'll save you a lot of time and effort and money down the road if you have to move the computer for some reason. Pick up any computer manual and you agree they're not easy to understand. But sometimes when you need to look up something, say in the computer's hardware manual about the insides, this is the only place you're going to find it. Give the manual a shot, but if you get confused, rush to the nearest phone and call the manufacturer, the store where you bought your computer. Tell them you looked it up on page so and so and, well, you gave up. They're used to it. As far as software manuals, it's the same thing. Look it up, and if you can't figure it out, call the software publisher. There's normally a phone number somewhere in the manual. Odds are it's in the very back or in the very front of the manual. If you lost your software manual, or maybe you spilled coffee all over it, bookstores are full of manuals that are usually a little better than the ones included with the software program. Keep in mind, though, they're all still manuals. This looks like a regular multi-plug outlet that's a simple way to turn one wall outlet into enough plugs for a computer, but it's not. It's different. This is called the surge protector, just like it says on the box. And this switch turns on everything that's connected to it. What you want to do is connect all the computer electrical outlets to it, like this one, and then flip the switch to turn it all on. A surge protector costs a few more dollars than a plain multi-plug strip, 
but it protects your computer from spikes that sometimes happen as power comes from the electrical company to your office or home computer. Spikes or power surges can damage a computer. Now a surge protector is like a little insurance policy for your computer that's well worth the money. Now you need DOS to run any IBM or compatible computer, and DOS is particular. New computer users usually forget where spaces go in commands, so be sure to pay close attention to these. Also a DOS command, it isn't a sentence, so you don't need to put a period on the end. The slash and the backslash keys are problem causers too. These are found here on your keyboard. This is the slash key, and this is the backslash key, and they're normally in this part of the keyboard. Now another mistake is answering DOS too quickly when you're asked a yes or no question. You only want to press Y for yes when you really mean to. Let me show you what I mean. Here at the DOS prompt, I'm going to type in the command erase, space, asterisk, period, asterisk, and press return. Now DOS asks me, all the files in the directory will be deleted. Are you really sure you want to do this? Well, obviously, I don't want to, so I'm going to press N for no, and press Enter, and all my files are still there, and DOS hasn't erased a thing. So normally, when DOS asks you a question that needs a Y or N answer, it's always a good idea to double check. Now from time to time, it's a good idea to clean out the information in your computer that you're not using any longer, such as old software programs or those reports from days long gone. Besides making room for some new cool software, it's easier to find the information you want on your computer when there's less files to sort through. Now before erasing the information, and if you think you may want to use it again, copy the files onto a floppy diskette. Now, for example, I'm going to copy the information in my letters directory on my computer's hard disk to the floppy diskette located in the A drive. Now, to do this, I'm at the DOS prompt, and I type in copy, space, asterisk, period, asterisk, and this tells DOS I want to copy everything, another space, and the name of the drive where the floppy disk is located, the A drive. So I type in A colon, press enter, and DOS will copy the files one by one onto that floppy diskette located in the A drive. And now when it's all done, we're going to check just to make sure that DOS did its job by typing the DIR command or the directory command, a space, and then the name of the drive where the floppy disk is located, the A drive. Press enter and we can see that all our files are there. Now to erase the files in my letters directory on my computer's hard disk, I use the DOS command erase. I type in erase, a space, and then the wildcard, asterisk, period, asterisk, to erase all those files. Press enter, and now DOS gives me the message, all the files in the directory will be deleted. Are you sure you really want to do this? I'm going to press Y for yes, because I am sure. Press enter, and now the files are all gone, and I'll show you by using the DOS directory command. Type in DIR, press enter, and as you can see, the files that were there once are no longer there, giving me a lot of room for some new software programs. There are lights on floppy disk drives that go on when the computer is putting information on or taking information off the floppy disk get located in the drive. Now never take a floppy disk out of the drive when the light is on or else you could damage the information on the disk. Always wait for the light to go off before you take a floppy disk get out. Now if the hard disk drive light is on, it means the computer's hard disk is still working. And just like with floppy disks, don't turn off the computer if the hard disk light is on. The only safe time to turn off the computer is when the disk drive lights are off and you're at the DOS prompt. On the purchase receipt of your computer, it tells you what types of diskettes that will work with your computer. Use the wrong type of diskettes and you may get error messages. Now there's two types of five and a quarter inch floppy disks that look the same on the outside but are different. First let's take a look at a low or double density diskette. 
This type of diskette holds about 180 pages of typed text. And a high-density diskette that we'll take a look at now holds about 600 pages of typed text. Almost always, low density has a ring around its collar right here, and a high-density diskette doesn't. A low-density disk drive uses a low or double-density diskette. A high-density disk drive can use both low or double-density diskettes and high-density diskettes. Now, there's also smaller floppy diskettes that are three and a half inch floppy diskettes. There's three types of these, low, high, and extended. Now, the most popular is low or high. Low or double density holds about 360 pages of type text. High density holds about 700 pages of type text. Low density has one hole on the top. High density has two holes, and that's the way you can tell them apart. A low-density disk drive uses low or double-density diskettes, and a high-density disk drive can use both low and high-density diskettes. If you have any questions which diskettes will work with your computer, show the salesperson where you're buying the diskettes the purchase received from your computer. Just like televisions come in different sizes, there are different size monitors. There are 12 inch, 14 inch, 17 inch, and so on. You measure a monitor just like you measure a television. This is a 14 inch monitor, and watch the way that I measure it. I don't measure it horizontally or vertically. You measure a monitor from corner to corner, diagonally. See, this monitor is 14 inches. Almost every monitor has two buttons on the front, the brightness and the contrast knobs. Now the best way to adjust a monitor is to first fill it up with some text. When the text is on the screen, turn the brightness up as far as it can go, and then work with the contrast until you can see the characters real well. Now another rule of thumb is to avoid any sunlight or overhead lighting from hitting the monitor. This causes glare, and glare makes the characters difficult to see. Some monitors like mine have a swivel base underneath so that you can get real comfortable with the monitor by moving it up and down or left and right. To avoid getting a pain in my neck while I'm sitting at my computer, my monitor is about 10 degrees below eye level. It works for me and it may for you too. Now if your monitor doesn't have this luxury, a swivel stand underneath, you can buy one at just about any office supply store like this one. From time to time you may need to clean the screen or the glass on the monitor because dust builds up. Never ever spray the glass cleaner directly on the monitor because the liquid could seep in along the sides of the monitor. Spray the cleaner on a rag first and then use the rag to clean the monitor. Well, I bet you never thought about using these for anything aside from just throwing them away. Old dryer sheets clean monitors great. A gentleman recently called my radio show and he explained he was having trouble using a floppy disk with his computer. The caller explained he put one floppy disk inside the disk drive and it worked fine. He put a second floppy disk inside the disk drive but it wouldn't work. Well, no wonder he was having trouble. I mean, this person didn't take one floppy disk get out before putting another one in. So call this a weakness of computer design, folks, but I have to say it. You're only allowed to have one floppy disk inside the disk drive at a time. You have to take a floppy disk get out in order to use a new one. Sometimes a mouse gets dirty, and this makes it hard to control the pointer on the screen. Now, if this happens to you, try cleaning the mouse before burying it. All you have to do is turn the mouse upside down, and there's a panel. Move this in the direction of the arrows, turn the mouse right side up, and the ball falls out. Now, take a cotton swab to clean any dirt that you may see on the inside, and do it gently. Now, if the ball is dirty, just take a damp rag and clean the ball of the mouse. And then when it's all dry, put it back inside the mouse, put the panel right back in the way you took it out, and then slide it so it's all tight. And now you have a clean mouse that's all ready for action.
Computers don't know you want to use the information you create again unless you save it. You have to tell the software program to save the information if you ever want to see it or use it again. But another part of saving the information you create using a computer has to do with having an exact copy outside, not inside the computer. Now these are called backups, and you can copy the information as a backup onto floppy diskettes. Or if you want to spend some extra money, it might be worth getting a tape backup drive that uses something like cassette tapes instead of floppy diskettes. Now, making tape backups, it's easier and faster than with floppy diskettes, but these units, they cost a few hundred dollars. Either way, backups are like insurance policies that in case the computer fails, you have an exact copy of all the information on your computer in a safe place. Now, making backups isn't hard to do. If you're using DOS 6.0, just type in backup and follow the instructions on the screen. It's not very difficult. Now, if you're using Windows in the Microsoft Tools window, there's an option that says backup. And to start it, point and double click, and you'll see Microsoft Backup taking a look at all the information on my computer. And as you can see, I have quite a bit of things on my computer. And I'll have the option to backup all the software programs or just the files, as you'll see in a moment. And now I'm asked if I want to backup, compare, restore, configure, or quit. Again, just follow the instructions on the screen. I just wanted to show you how easy it is to make a backup. First, we're going to say where we want the backup to go. I'm going to make the backup on the floppy diskette located in my A drive. And now I select it, I'm going to start the backup by pointing and clicking on starting backup. I get a little message here and I'm going to point and click on OK. All it says is different options I can do. And now the backup has been started and once it's completed, all the information on my computer will be safely stored on floppy diskettes. The information you created using the software programs is harder to duplicate. You should have two or three sets of backups and then alternate between them. Say one set for week one, another set for week two, and then maybe even a set for week three. And then go back to use week one, week two, week three, and so on. Now some people back up the information on their computer every day. So this way, just in case the computer's hard disk fails, they've only lost one day's work. The following DOS commands shouldn't be used by new or intermediate computer users. It's okay to use these commands if you know what you're doing, but if you don't, I want you to stay away from them. A lot of people make a mistake using a computer and think, hey, I'll just type in recover and see what happens. Now the computer won't blow up if you type in recover or anything like that, but you could lose all the information on your computer. Do yourself a favor and don't play around with these DOS commands unless you really know what you're doing. The DOS commands are CTTY, FDISC, Format C colon, and Recover. Unless you know what you're doing, there are some files inside your computer that you should never mess around with. Now, a lot of people touch these files when they're trying to make their computer run better or faster. Now, if you want to touch these files, however, I want you to first copy them onto a floppy diskette so you can always put them back on your computer's hard disk if you need to. Now, these files are the autoexec.bat file, that config.sys file, and any file in the Windows directory that has an INI as a file extension. First, let's copy that autoexec bat file onto the floppy diskette in my disk drive. To copy the file, use the DOS copy command, a space in the name of the file that we want to copy, or the autoexec, a period, a BAT, press the space bar, and now we need to tell DOS where we want to copy the file, or the floppy diskette located in the A drive. And DOS gives you the message that one file has been copied. Follow the same procedure using the DOS copy command to get those important files onto a floppy diskette. Because when you have those important files on a floppy diskette, you have them in a safe place whenever you need them. A computer is much like any other ordinary home appliance, say a washer, dryer, or dishwasher that can break from time to time. Now, if your computer's hard disk decides to stop working one day when you turn the computer on, 
A quick start is having a system or startup disk. A startup disk has some files on it that the computer needs to get up and get going. It's a good idea to keep a system disk in a safe place, and to make one, all we do is put a formatted floppy disk into the A drive, and then at the DOS prompt, type in SYS space A colon, press enter, and all the files that my computer needs to get up and going will be put onto that formatted floppy diskette. So should your computer hard disk ever stop working, just restart the computer with this diskette, the system disk, inside the computer. Most of the time, you'll be able to go to the C drive or the hard disk to at least check things out and maybe even back up the information on the computer before taking that computer in for some service. You probably wouldn't want to jump out of your car while driving down the freeway. Well, turning off your computer while software is still on the screen is a definite no-no. You should always formally exit a software program before turning off your computer. Otherwise, you run the risk of having the information damaged or worse, gone. The only time you should turn off your computer is when you see the system prompt on your computer screen. You should only use software with your computer that you're 100% sure where it came from. Anytime you buy software, it should have a plastic covering on it or a shrink wrap, so this way you know that you're the first person using it. Perhaps you've heard about computer viruses. Computer viruses cause files in your computer to disappear or generally can make them act weird. Sharing software or disks with other people is one way that viruses spread. Antivirus software, like this program here, checks your computer disks and files for any viruses. DOS 6.0 has an antivirus software included with it. Antivirus software, it's like a flu shot for your computer. Let's check this floppy disk for any viruses. And to do that, first I put the floppy diskette into the drive. We're going to use Microsoft Tools antivirus software to check my floppy diskette for any viruses. I point and double click to start the program and next I'll be asked which disk drive in my computer I'd like to check for any viruses. I want to check the floppy disk in drive A so I'll point and click there. First Microsoft Tools will take a look at what's on the floppy disk and now I'm going to point and click on detect and clean which tells Microsoft Tools to first go take a look at the memory in my computer for any viruses and next Microsoft Antivirus We'll look at the files on the floppy diskette, see if there's a virus on there, and if it finds any, it'll clean it up for me. And once it's all done, I get a little statistics report. I'm going to point and click on OK, and that's all it takes to see if a floppy diskette has a computer virus. Well, it's nice to know that this diskette does not have a computer virus on it. It's a good idea to check your computer for any viruses from time to time. It's not tough to connect a printer to your computer. There's a cable and it only fits in one way. One side goes in the printer, the other side goes in the back of the computer where it's marked LPT1. Now when the printer is ready to accept information, the online light is lit up. When the printer is online, it's ready to accept information. And you also see where it says ready right here in the panel. Now sometimes information gets stuck in the printer and the form feed button stays lit up. When this happens to you, Take the printer offline and then press the form feed button and soon you see the information coming out of your printer. After you connect your printer to your computer, there's one more step. You need to tell the software what kind of printer you have and where it's connected. You find this in the printer setup part of the software program. On the printer list, look for the manufacturer of your printer and the model number. Now, if it's not there, a good guess for dot matrix printers is picking an Epson printer, and for laser printers, it's a Hewlett Packard printer. You see, Epson and Hewlett Packard are the two top printer manufacturers, and other printer manufacturers make sure that their products work like or emulate an Epson or Hewlett Packard printer. 
Printers come with a manual, and you can find what type of printer your printer emulates in normally the setup or the configuration section. Having your computer fixed is a lot like having a regular appliance, say a washing machine repaired. You should always get an estimate that includes the hourly charge, what the service thinks the problem is, the work that they will perform, and how long the service center thinks it will take to fix that computer. It's also a good idea to check the computer's manufacturer's warranty that's sometimes on your purchase receipt because sometimes what needs to be fixed is already covered under the warranty and you shouldn't have to pay to have this fixed then. Ask the computer repair center to list line by line all the parts that are in your computer along with any serial numbers. Or you could do this yourself when you drop off your computer. This way you know what you pick up from the service center is exactly what you dropped off. When the computer doesn't work right, there's no little gremlin inside. It's either a hardware, software, or combination problem. To figure out exactly what is going on, ask yourself a few questions. Does the problem, say the screen isn't quite right, happen once in a while using one software program but not in another? Odds are you have the monitor configured wrong in the software program that's giving you the problem. Does the screen act up in all software programs? Well, this tells you it's a hardware problem. What about your printer? Did the printer work fine yesterday or last week and then suddenly a problem just popped up? Odds are it's a hardware problem and sometimes the only thing wrong is that the cable is loose. So to fix it, just put the cable right back in where it goes and it's that easy to fix. Now if you're not sure what's wrong with your computer, call an authorized service center that's staffed with experts. They'll fix you up in a jiffy and let you get back to work. You're not alone when you buy a software program. Generally speaking, most software is sold with an initial period of 30 to 90 days of unlimited free support, so you can call the software publisher with any questions. Afterwards, you may be charged technical support charges, though. Now, unlimited support may or may not have a toll-free number. Sometimes it's even a 900 number, and you're charged by the minute. Keep in mind, it normally takes longer than two or three minutes to fix a computer problem, and you could rack up some pretty hefty phone bills on a 900 number. Unlimited toll-free support means you can call the software company as much as you like, and they or the phone company won't charge you. In your software manual, and it's normally in the back, is a whole list of phone numbers for you to call as a registered owner of that software program. It's easy to get frustrated using a computer. I cannot tell you how many times people have told me, Kim, I'm ready to throw my computer out the window. When and if you feel the urge, take five minutes, take a walk, and then try it again. You'll come back with a fresh new attitude, and odds are, better able to do what you wanted to in the first place, only easier. Using a computer, it's not tough. It's like riding a bike. Once you get it down, it's a snap. 